Uh, at any rate, um, I would like you to take a few moments at some point and read what I call Mosby's Warby for Success. I took this over the course of five pages out of his memoirs. Uh, one of my favorite passages about Mosby is the last, uh, last paragraph, uh, which would be page two, but actually it's page one, um, in which Mosby says, um, I often send small squads at night to attack and run into pickets along the line of several miles. Of course, these alarms were very annoying, for no human being knows how sweet sleep is for the soldier. How many veterans do we have here? How many? <laughs> Nobody knows, no human being knows how sweet sleep is for the soldier. I wanted to use and consume the Northern Cavalry in hard work. I often thought that their fierce hostility to me was more on account of the sleep I made them lose and the number we killed or captured. But the true secret was that it was an exciting, a fascinating life, and its attractions far more counterbalanced its hardships and dangers. Most of these men had no camp duty to do, which, however necessary, is disgusting to men of high spirit. To put them to such routine work is pretty much like hitching a racehorse to a plow. There you go. Well, to get get rolling here, I know that uh, Frank told me that you all would be more interested in hearing about fighting than uh, growing up. So I'll, I'll just spend a little bit of time uh, talking about Mosby's early years. But before we get into that, I'd like to go through uh, what I call the tapestry of voices on Mosby. This is things uh, Mosby has said or things people have said about him that I'd like to share with you. One of them is uh, actually the second uh, printout that I have uh, in the handout here. Uh, he writes, uh, the Ranger John Munson writes about Mosby in 1906. In his book, Reminiscences of a Mosby Gorilla, he writes, Mosby's correct estimate of men, his absolute freedom from jealousy and selfishness, his unerring judgment of critical moments, his devotion to his men, his eternal vigilance, his unobtrusive bravery, and his exalted sense of personal honor, all combined to create in the minds and hearts of those who served him a sort of hero worship. Long before I set eyes on him, I looked forward to the day when I would be able to take, to take my head off in his presence and offer to follow him. That's pretty much, pretty much summed it up the way his men looked at him. Some of our captured men returned to the regiment, paroled by Mosby, who sent a verbal message to the lieutenant colonel that, unless the men were better armed and equipped, we wouldn't pay to capture them. <laughs> Mosby said, I will tolerate no blasphemy or profanity in my command under any circumstances except one. When summoning an enemy to surrender, I permit you to say, surrender, you Yankee son of a bitch. <laughs> It's Colonel Mosby, don't you remember me? Oh, no, it ain't. Colonel Mosby was here 10 days ago, badly wounded. And I, and I wouldn't believe you unless I saw the wound. And this is from a woman who uh, dressed Mosby's wound where he was shot in the groin uh, after a second wounding. And he was bleeding profusely from that wound. And he showed up, you know, a couple of days later, 10 days later, and he's riding a horse. <laughs> As glides and sees the shark, rides Mosby through green dark. That's from poet Herman Melville in his poem, The Scout Toward All's Baldy, from a book called Battle Pieces and Aspects of the War, 1866. Mosby has annoyed me and captured a few wagons. We hung one at one and shot six of his men yesterday. General Phil Sheridan wrote that in response to Grant's message on August 17, 1864. Well, Grant writes back, where any of Mosby's men are caught, hang them without trial. Take that. Do you remember me? No, but I remember your horse. That was Mosby to Charles Humphreys, who was a chaplain with the Second Massachusetts Cavalry, uh, and, uh, you know, after a fight in August of 1864. 
the quickest way for Southern people to get even with the Yankees is to marry them. <laughs> Worse than both himself. I like that because I'm seriously involved with a lady from Cleveland. <laughs> she insulted me one night. We went to a blue and gray ball and she wore this beautiful blue dress. I thought she did it to match her pretty blue eyes. She said, no, it's Yankee blue. <laughs> Thanks, me. Mosby's a good talker. Not very fluent, perhaps, but what he says is generally worthy of attention. His intelligence is far above average, of which might be found in Congress, which is not, after all, much of a compliment. That's from a reporter from the New York Herald in December 1876. There were probably but a few men in the South who could have commanded successfully a separate detachment in the rear of an opposing army and so near to the border of hostilities as long as he did without losing his entire command. That was by Ulysses S. Grant in his personal memoirs in 1885. Colonel, do you believe in hell? Oh, indeed. Hell is being a Republican in Virginia. <laughs> That was most of his reply to an ordained minister uh, toward the end of his life. And it was an anecdote that was related by his grandson, Beverly Mosby Coleman, who overheard the conversation. You have to remember that Mosby's, one of Mosby's greatest uh, sins, if you will, uh, was becoming a Republican. Uh, of course, after the war, they were all, of course, before and during and after the war, everybody in the South was Democrats. And in 1872, Mosby came out again for Grant. And it nearly cost him his life, certainly nearly cost him his entire business. Uh, he was shot at in Warrington in 1877, the fall of 1877. And uh, that led to his plea to Ulysses Grant to help him. And it was Grant who uh, appealed to President Arthur B. Hayes. And it was, it was Hayes who appointed Mosby as U.S. Consul to Hong Kong. And the last quote. <laughs> yes, think I'm out of town already. <laughs> that the Republicans took care of their own. Uh, here's the last quote. Modern skepticism has destroyed one of the most beautiful creations of epic ages, the belief that the spirits of dead warriors meet daily in the halls of Mount Pella. And there, around the festive board, recounts the deeds they did in the other world. For this evening, at least, let us adopt the ancient superstition, if superstition it be. It may be presumptuous in me that the men who belong to my command may be forgiven for thinking that in that assembly of heroes when the feast of the wild